Aloha and welcome to this episode of Conservation Conversations Hawaii. Today I'm so excited to welcome my guest Tamara Sherrill, Executive Director of the Maui Nui Botanical Gardens. Welcome Tamara. Aloha, Kohea. Thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. No problem. So, Happy to be here. Yes, yeah, so the Maui Nui Botanical Gardens uh, has, carries a very important mission to help save some of the uh, most rare and endangered native Hawaiian plants and also some of the what we call canoe plants. And I know we'll talk more about that a little later. But I wanted to get into some of the really interesting history behind the garden because this location, uh, which is across from the War Memorial Stadium, Stadium in Kahului, Maui, it used to be the community zoo at one point. That's I don't know right. if you remember when it was still a zoo. I think it uh, officially shut down in 1997, is that correct? That's right, 1997. It actually, um, the first native plantings there were planted around 1976 when it still was the zoo. And Renee Silva, who's a native Hawaiian, who was also a groundskeeper at the zoo, was one of the first people to plant native Hawaiian plants in a landscape. That's really cool. So even way back when, there was somebody who was already interested in horticulture, I guess, and, and saving some of our more, most rare species. You know, yeah, ho- I've heard the, the story is, you know, Rene was a turtle fisherman, and he was one of the first people to help the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service get the both species of sea turtles listed as endangered. So he put away his nets, and he lived on pa- Paia Bay. And um, his family still owns property there on Paia Bay, and he used to hike the coast. And because Maui Nui Botanical Gardens, when it was the zoo, you know, the zoo is on an old coastal remnant dune system. So a lot of the plants he collected along the coast did really well there. Putting away his nets is a very mild uh, way of putting what he actually did with his nets and what I heard what he did with his boat is really fully committing himself to uh, protecting Native Hawaiian species. So how awesome. What a great role model that was for a lot of people still to this day. Absolutely. Yeah. That's right. So um, tell us about the mission of the Mainui Botanical Gardens and when it got started and established formally. And I think the the county is a big help. The county of Maui is a big help in in that and supporting the gardens. Uh, But tell us about the mission. Absolutely. So our mission is to foster appreciation and understanding of Maui Nui's plants and their role in Hawaiian cultural expression by providing a gathering place for discovery, conservation, and education. And it is located in Keopuolani Park, which is a county park. And so we are, you know, the Parks Department, we have a long-term lease with the Parks Department. We're a, we're a nonprofit that stewards that portion of the park. That used to be the zoo and has all of these old native plants um, but our vision is widespread preservation conservation and integration of hawaiian native and canoe plants throughout maui nui so it's something that i've been part of this project for more than 20 years now and i've really seen some changes happening not just because of what maui nui botanical gardens is doing but because of the, just the change in the culture and all the other conservation groups that are doing so much work on Maui. Right, and so you've been with the gardens for 20 years now, you said? Is that well, right? I started, yeah, I, I started in 2001 as the nursery manager and curator. So a lot of right. the species that are there, um, I did a lot of hiking with Native Hawaiian Plant Society and, you know, a little bit with Renee Silva and um, brought in some new species that weren't there before. And then we brought back some of the trees that were, not doing so well that Renee had planted. So, yeah, since 2001. Right, that's a big transition from being the nursery manager, manager to the executive director. Do you, do you miss oh. being getting your hands dirt, more dirty than they than you do now and being back in the nursery every day? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so much. <laughs> but um We have such a fantastic team, and one of the things that makes me really happy is to know how much fun the job is because I did it. So, right, I I know it's a really really fun uh, thing to do with your day. Well, that's definitely a bonus for the gardens that you come with that expertise, you know, as well as now you know managing the entire operation. There's a lot of good botanists and ethnobotanists here in Hawaii, so I'm yeah, I learn a lot from them. Right. Well, it's a really great network of conservationists that we have on Maui and within the state of Hawaii. You mentioned canoe plants, and I'm not sure that everybody is 
aware of uh, what that means and what does that refer to, canoe plants? Yeah, canoe plants. That's a, a one that's really interesting because, you know, we talked about the role of Maui Nui's plants and, and in Hawaiian cultural expression. And canoe plants, there were 26 species of plants uh, that are believed to have come on the first voyaging canoes from Tahiti, Tahiti and the Marquesas. Um, and those, this was over several journeys, of course, but overall about 26 species. But from those 26 species, um, especially with crops like kalo or taro, wala or sweet potato, kohl or sugar cane, ava or kava, and also, um, last but not least, maya or banana, those particular canoe plants from just a few original varieties, more than a thousand unique Hawaiian varieties evolved in place as they were grown here in Hawaii long before European contact. So canoe plants includes all of those. Right. So canoe plants, do you think they mainly consisted of the food plants or were some more medicinal or what, what, do, you, what do you think the general breakdown was? Because I, I, from I mean, what I understand, yeah. there weren't a lot of food plants here that were established so it was really important that they went back and forth um, between the islands of Polynesia to bring back food plants. Yeah food plants crop plants are a huge part but of those 26 species a, a large part were trees and um, use plants that were useful for things like medicine house building canoe building mm -hmm. um, everyday household items that kind of thing so you know, they're the real basis of a lot of Hawaiian cultural traditions. And so, you know, even though they may exist in some form in other Pacific islands, some of those forms now here are really unique to Hawaii. And so it's important to preserve those so that we don't lose that, that knowledge that's connected to those types of plants. Plants are just so amazing. They Each one has a really special story as well as, you know, many uses. And when you think about it, when they came over in the canoes, they were bringing over their own... Costco, their own Lowe's and <laughs> Home Depot. I mean, they, they really brought things that really necessitated and uh, made survival uh, possible and not even just surviving, but thriving in the island. So that's really cool. So spend a lot, or dedicate a lot of your time and effort on the rare and endangered Native Hawaiian plants. Uh, so you have a good uh, number of those that you're working on. Can you talk about some of them? Absolutely. Um so native Hawaiian plants, you know, there's probably 1,100 in Hawaii, and of those, nearly 400 are listed as endangered or threatened, federally listed and also listed by the state of Hawaii. Um, you know, these are native, these are plants that inhabit wild areas that did not, were not introduced by people, so they arrived without any human help. And, you know, they're under threat by a lot of the invasive species that we have in Hawaii. And one thing that's kind of interesting about the difference between those two types of plants, canoe plants and native plants, is how we work with them in conservation. So horticulture is not the only way to preserve plants, but it's one of the ways that we work with plants at the botanical mm -hmm. gardens to support land managers who take care of those wild areas where the native plants live. And native plants, are really, it's really important that they have a lot of genetic diversity and that they have large populations in the wild to survive. They need that kind of diversity to be able to deal with all the environmental changes that they have to deal with, and that especially the ones that we brought to the islands. And so that means they have to re reproduce from seeds, and that makes a wide variety of genetically distinct individuals, whereas something like um, Hawaiian sugarcane varieties or Hawaiian kalo are only propagated now clonally. So those are not from seeds, they're from cuttings. They're from, and so when you're taking a cutting, you're making an exact replica of the same exact individual that was selected by a Hawaiian farmer long, long ago. So, so how, how many times don't... over can you take cuttings from the same genetic uh, type, I guess, and, and keep replicating that and reproducing that? Oh, that's a great question i've what we've experienced with the hawaiian canoe crops is that it's been hundreds of years some of these are hundreds of years old and they're being still being cloned and they still have the same characteristics if you look at the the maya the banana variety the manini which is a variegated the only variegated variety in the world it's still the same it still has variegation but every once in a while 
you'll get one offshoot that's a little bit different. It'll be all green or all white, but it always will revert back. Some of the mm -hmm. cakey will revert back to the green and white mixed variegated. So it does shift and change, and that's how you get new varieties, but there's always a basis of an old variety because they're very stable. They've been grown for a long time. That's different. Mm -hmm. If you take cuttings from native plants, it does eventually, they, they you can't propagate healthy plants from them over a long period of time. So different different for different plants. When you're talking about the Maya, the native banana, it made me wonder about um, the banana bunchy top virus and other you know, invasive species that we have that um, are impacting you know, our banana varieties. And ha have the native Maya been impacted by those invasive pests and diseases? There are estimated that we were at least 40 unique Hawaiian Maya varieties. And now there are about 19 that are still in existence. Um, Angela K. Kepler is a Maui resident who wrote an amazing book in about 2011 um, about Hawaiian bananas and bananas of the Pacific and all. And it's it's a it's a it's actually a just a bible. It's a it's about it's got thousand pages or so. And yeah, I've she, seen it. It's a great book. Yeah, I recommend it. It's um, so in that book you can read about banana bunchy top, corn borer all the diseases and different insects that affect Maya. And yes, Hawaiian banana varieties are very, very susceptible. So mm -hmm. it's important that, you know, because these these are sort of domesticated plants, they're completely dependent on people. They're right. not like native plants and that they can just keep going on their own for decades and decades. Yeah. And I know so, this, is yeah. a, this is a topic for a whole nother day and, and some other experts that we have in our community, but it's just mind boggling how many new pests and diseases are introduced to our state every i don't know every week every month every year it's just incredible people would be just it's mind-boggling to know and you know so it's really important that the community really gets involved in um you know early detection and being able to recognize some of these um, things that they can help report them so they can be you know handled and uh, taken care of a lot sooner and for a lot cheaper, I might add too. But yes, I was about to say that. But absolutely, there's nothing, there's no better money spent than keeping the pests from getting in in the first place because it's so difficult to control them once they get here. And if you know, call we're in right in the middle of Kahului, so we're near the forts, we're near the airport, we're near the you know where all of the containers are coming in, and that's where that's where the the possible new pests can come in and so um the people who are entomologists who are looking for new pests often come to the garden to see what's new what's what's just arrived because we have so many different species and yet we're so close to where the new pests might be right right so you know going back to those uh, rare and endangered native hawaiian plants that uh, we were talking about earlier um so there is one in particular that is uh very close to my heart which is the kanaloa kaho'olaviensis and you have i don't know how many you have at the garden there now but i know that there was at least one that was um harvested or maybe seeds were harvested off the island of Koho'olawe and brought to the gardens um, to be cultivated and the last time I saw it it was really really huge and so what's the status now of that that's that's such a that's a whole show in itself that's uh the best story I know of what happens when a wild native plant population gets too small um, how much effort and time and money and blood, sweat, and tears it takes to bring it back from the brink of extinction. So, yeah. you know, this was a plant that was discovered on Ale Ale Islet off of Koho'olawe, you know, in 1994, which was after the military bombings had happened. And it was a, not only a new species, but a new genera. It was a new genus. So I didn't realize you had flown in a helicopter over it and... You know, I've never been out there myself, um, but I, we received two seeds in um, 2008 from Ken Wood, who is the main National Tropical Botanical Gardens um, field biologist, field botanist who worked with this species. Mm -hmm. And National Tropical Botanical Gardens had grown it before in cultivation from the wild plants on Ali Ali. And you said there were only two ever known and only one of them ever produced seeds. 
since it was discovered. So long story short, we ended up with one individual that we nurtured for 12 years and another individual at another location in Maui that a really good horticulturalist, Anna Palomino, nurtured. And her plant was always healthier than ours. Ours was always bigger. Ours bloomed a lot. We did so many different things. We sent cuttings for tissue culture to Lion Arboretum. They attempted over and over again to propagate these plants right. for tissue Lion, culture. Lion Arboretum on Oahu. On Oahu, mm -hmm. right. They have a state-of-the-art micropropagation lab that is run by Nelly Sugii, who's now the interim director there at Lion Arboretum. And they have conserved many, many, many plants that can't produce reproduce from seed anymore through tissue culture, which is um, micro cuttings, micro propagation. But all other, I won't go into the whole story, but so many other attempts were made over the last 12 years. And finally, a couple of years ago, uh, Doug Akimoto, who is at the Poholi Rare Plant Facility, did get a few cuttings to root. Unfortunately, none of the Maui Nui individuals. So mm -hmm. just one individual, the one that Anna was taking care of. There were a couple of cuttings that made it. Then, in January of this year, when every, right before everything started to get crazy, um, we were doing something we'd done before. We were running pollen back and forth between the two plants, trying to cross-pollinate it and make seeds. And how, how, do you, how do you this. do that exactly? How do you... Well, I have some pictures you can show, but basically, we learned from various people that you take a cheap uh, vibrating toothbrush and, and you put it on the on the stem of the flower and you have to get it at just the right time there's only just a couple hours a day that wow. it, the pollen's ready to fall off you vibrate it and then the the pollen falls off into a piece of parchment paper you fold that up you take it to the other plant you use a paintbrush to cross pollinate on what is hopefully a receptive flower on another plant and you... we tried this before but this was the only oh. time in 12 years that both plants had bloomed at the same time wow the, it's really interesting that you had to use a vibrating toothbrush. I mean, I'm wondering if that mimics what its native pollinator is. And do you know what the what its native pollinator is? I don't. I don't think anyone's ever observed it at the time that they were writing things yeah. down. But you know, there are every there are so many insects that have vibrations to their wings. I mean, you know, hylias, the native bees, and um, yeah, I, I I don't know what the native pollinator would have been. We do see bees on the flowers. We did see mm -hmm. bees. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, um, Anna was able to get seeds off of her plant in March, right, as the pandemic was starting. Mm -hmm. And so for the first time ever, there's plants that came from cultivation. And it went from uh, two individuals to 23. Wow. And so wow. the largest population since it was ever discovered. Yeah. Right. It's been some time now since the pandemic began. Um, did, did you, do you know what, how they're doing now? And out of the 23, if, does she still have they're, 23? <laughs> I think she's got 22 from what I've heard and they're doing great. And the trick now is how to find the funding to take care of that many plants. Um, they're so rare that they can't be risked in the ground yet. Ultimately, Koholave would like to have them back at, on the island and so the goal is to get a hundred seedlings or a hundred cuttings mm -hmm. to get back on mm -hmm. started in as, as a wild population but mm -hmm. until that time it's going to take a lot of support a lot of money and a lot of partners to grow out all these right. plants to full maturity and try to get them to produce more seeds well if anybody can do it you know anna pelamino of ho'olava farms she's awesome i mean and this is something that yes absolutely you know, people are writing the book writing the manual as they're doing their work there's nothing they can really draw from to tell them how to to save this plant so they're basically Doing a lot yeah, of it's not like you can do an experiment on two individuals, right? Right, right, right. So, yeah, it would be great to see those uh, plants reestablished back on Koho Olave. But I think there was also some research done that found that the Kanaloa was actually more common on some of the main islands. Is that right? Yes. Once um, upon a time. When, yeah, when Ken Wood mm -hmm. described it originally, from what I understand, there they 
they were able to get pollen and look at pollen for the first time. And so from that, they compared it to pollen fossils and found out that it was a widespread plant all over the Isthmus of Maui and, and many other islands, too. I think he's an awesome botanist as well. Just amazing wealth of knowledge. If anyone has not met Ken and has a chance to, I mean, just I would ask him a lot of questions. He really has uh, done a lot for Hawaii and, and Hawaiian botany. Absolutely agree. And, you know, I want to shout out to Hank Oppenheimer, with the Plant Extinction Prevention Program, because that's the kind of work he's doing. He's repelling, he's climbing cliffs. He's, you know, he and his compatriots on the other islands who work for the Plant Extinction Prevention Program are doing uh, that kind of work in really dangerous conditions a lot of times, looking for the last of the last of things. Right. You can't be somebody, to do this work, you can't be somebody who wants to sit in an office with air conditioning and front of a computer all day and you know no. you can't be that kind of person you it really is uh, sometimes uh you know the danger is just inherent in that kind of work and it really is a, a, a sacrifice in a lot of ways so they really are conservation heroes well i can tell you a story it's not about danger but about the Kanaloa when oh, okay. um which is just like the, uh, I don't know, maybe the emotional danger of trying to take care of the last of something. Mm. And about a few mm. years ago, when I was the one who was still taking care of the one individual that we had, it had been getting sick and it had a lot of different problems um, that had been diagnosed and we were treating them. But, you know, we knew that we were holding off its ultimate death. And I was so worried that it was going to go any moment. So we actually had... Um, uh, some, someone from uh, who was connected to Koalave Island Reserve Commission brought a friend over who did some oli and and did some chanting and and it was very moving and after and and the and and she renamed the plant Puuvai for heart because okay. the seeds Pu'uvai. have a heart shape mm-hmm. yeah Puuvai mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and I wasn't familiar with anything that she was doing but at the end of that I was crying and she was basically like you know smooshing me in a hug and patting my head and comforting me and I was just like this is so hard to keep this plant alive I mean it's a lot of work you know and we had spent eleven thousand dollars that year alone on that one plant and still it was going downhill and so um, I'm just really grateful <laughs> that, you know, what's, what's kind of funny about it is that it had been producing flowers, but they were only male flowers. And we knew that it had the capability of having both male and female flowers. And so the chanting was to turn the plants to help it realize its feminine side. So she told me, <laughs> I think you should only call it she from here on out. And I said, OK, we're going to call it she. I'll tell you what. Oh, yeah, six months later, we had five little fruits on there. Now, they didn't produce a seed. They did just fall off, but it did it, you know. It did wow. produce female flowers after wow. that. So. Wow, I got chicken skin when you were telling that story. <laughs> I mean, wow. Talk about miracles and just the power of Oli and uh, Pule, actually. Yeah, wow. it was. That is intense pressure. To know that you are trying to keep something alive that is down to the last one, the last individual, the last couple of plants. I mean, I, I don't know if I could handle that kind of pressure myself. That's why I, I feel for you. But that is a, an awesome responsibility. Well, I'm grateful to the people that are working at the garden right now. Um, we've got a great young team. Chris Devella is our garden and nursery manager. And he took over um, taking care of that plant for the last six years and he did a stellar stellar job and i'm sure it wouldn't have survived as long as it did interestingly it did die this year or last year right after Mm -hmm. it flowered and right after those seedlings germinated so it was like it just held on long enough for those new seedlings to come into the world and then it gave it up so now there's only one it provided for the future though right yeah, it absolutely, I, I hope so. I hope the cross-pollination works. I'd like yeah. to believe that it did. And, no way of actually knowing. And I know you have other plants uh, at the garden that you are also trying to help save the species, and that might be down to just a handful of individuals left. And, you know, for, for people out there who are not a part of the conservation world, 
who are not um, invested yet, I'd like to say, um, in saving native Hawaiian species or, or native species of anywhere in the world, really. Um, people who aren't in, invested in that and interested. Um, in your own thoughts, in your own words, why would it be important to save a, a plant that is down to the last few individuals that is facing extinction? What, what is the value, do you think, for doing that? And you know, given the time, the effort, the expense that it takes, uh, why, why do you think that that is worth it to, to do? That's a that's got a long answer, and I won't. I, I probably can't do that justice, but I. I can definitely sympathize with people who say, uh, "What's the point? It's just a plant." You know, I've certainly when I first started going on hikes with Native Hawaiian Plant Society, we would go through lava flows, and it would be hot, and we would hike miles and miles and miles, and we would come to a little tiny, you know, plant that was six inches high, and they would go, there it is! Oh, there it is! And they'd be so excited, I'd be like, what? <laughs> you know, it, all this for that? But when I learned more about it, I mean, Hawaii is such a unique place, and we have, what, almost 90% in the endemism here in our plants. I mean, if you think about the millions of years that each of those species took to get to the forms that they are, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, who are we to say that it's okay for them to disappear? That's really what it comes down to for me. Right. And I know a lot of other people say, oh, I mean, plants are the basis of medicine, and there's so many different useful things. They're the basis of Hawaiian culture. All those are good reasons, but for me, it just comes down to, I'm not going to argue with millions of years of evolution. I'm just going to try to not, I'm just going to try to undo some of the damage, you know. Right. When I think of saving, you know, endangered species and why that's important, I think of the ecosystem, that each of these plants are part of a system, a very important system that provides us with clean air, provides us with water that we need to live and to survive, especially being on a very remote set of islands. And when you take out something or take out a piece of that puzzle or you, you know, taking something very vital and important that belongs to the system, I somehow think the system cannot operate at its fullest, highest potential. And so if you can do something to save it and put that back and help it become as, you know, a, a, a vital flourishing system or ecosystem again, then I think that's worth it. Because ultimately that points back to our own ability to survive and thrive in the islands, right? Yep, that's true. And I, you know, and Hawaii watersheds being the basis of our water supply. Um, are you familiar with Tom Giambelluca? Am yes, I saying I his am. last name right? Yes, Giambelluca. Jembaluka, yes. Didn't I hope I'm saying it right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, Tom, if we said it wrong. Sorry, Tom. But, um, he, he's been doing some really interesting research that finally is showing that the transpiration rates of invasive, a forest made of invasive trees are much higher than the transpiration rates of native forests. So we're literally losing water out the leaves of these trees and it's being sucked out of the soil. And that's where our water supply comes from. Right. So native forests really do um, provide more fresh water for humans. So yeah, ecosystem mm. services, that's important. This is just such a big web, really. I mean, one thing just leads to another, you know, uh, even going back to water. I mean, people think water comes from the faucet, but where does it uh, trace back to? Ultimately, it traces back to the native or the ecosystem that it came from, right? And the water cycle and the things that you learn in the fourth grade about the water cycle. Um, so every, every part of the puzzle, it, it really is important. And unless we can save some of these species and put them back in a way that is really uh, significant, we may not know what their true function was, but maybe that's something that we can rediscover if we're successful. So, yeah, I, I wish you all the success and everybody who does work like you because um, it's just, I, I don't know, that's a lot of pressure It's a, uh, to do what you do. 
<laughs> and I want to talk more about the seed banking, but you know, I want to uh, ask you a few questions just to get to know you a little bit more. Uh, and then besides the amazing work that you do. So uh, what high school did you go to? I went to a high school nobody's ever heard of. It's called SAIL, School for Applied Individualized Learning. When I was a um, sophomore in a regular public high school, this was in Tallahassee, Florida, where I grew up, um, I had read a book about um, alternative schools and we had one alternative school in Tallahassee, Florida, so I decided to go there. And it was great. We went on um, all kinds of trips instead of doing exams. We had a great drama program. Um, I might have missed out on a little bit of math. <laughs> you might have missed out on a little bit of math. That sounds like I there's a story it. behind that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so is it safe to say math wasn't your best subject? It wasn't, but I got interested in it later. <laughs> mm. And so what was your best subject? English. I really loved writing and reading. Awesome. So what got you interested in plants at, at your earliest recollection? What, what got you really fascinated and just interested in plants? I just, I camped a lot as a kid and um, I spent a lot of time outside and I always felt safest in the woods. That was where I had the most fun and that's where I always felt like it was the safest to be. Mm. We talked about the pandemic earlier. Is there anything that you've learned, um, like a new skill since the pandemic started in March? And I know you had time, you've had time to work from home a little bit and haven't been able to do as much on the weekends and over the holidays. Is, is there any new skill that you picked up? Yes, I, I got really interested in Ulana. I got interested in weaving in the last uh, six or seven months. I, I, one of the few workshops that we could have was a new weaving, a coconut leaf weaving class um, with Ui Kohui and Mario Siatris. And I sat in on one of them and got just fascinated by it, made a million baskets. And then I got interested in Mahalo weaving after that. Mm. Um, I have a bracelet on that's by Ohaku Koho Ohanohano that says Maui Nui Botanical Gardens and he made it 10 years ago and I'd always wanted to learn how to do it so I just started weaving and picked it up. I, I made these, you know, I've been giving a lot away. <laughs> Those are really nice, very Thank beautiful you. job and I've never seen any weaving that had words like on a bracelet, that's really yes, cool. Yes, he is a master. Wow. Um, I, I have relatives who are really good at low hollow weaving, but I, I don't think that skill transferred down to me, unfortunately. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just enjoy your, your work, the fruits of your labor. So what is a place that you've been to outside of Hawaii? Um, and let's just say outside of Tallahassee also. Uh, mm -hmm. What is a place, what is one of the most interesting places you've been that you would encourage other people to visit and why? Oh, I can't separate the two. I, did, I, I took a trip to Fiji and New Zealand, and I would just say both. Um, Fiji because just I would love to travel more in the Pacific and meet the people. I'd never met people like that before. I, they were amazing. Um, and then New Zealand because that was the only place I'd ever been where I could drive. We drove all day long, didn't see another car. And everywhere around us was completely habitable, wonderful, beautiful forest, beautiful. It was just, it was just really a, a beautiful place. So, and it was so, it was so remote, at least at that time. Sounds beautiful. And I've always wanted to go to New Zealand as well. There's just something that's drawing me there. Maybe one day I'll get there. Uh, so who is a, a person, uh, it can be anyone, somebody who's not even uh, around anymore, living anymore. Who, what, who is one person that inspires you and, and why is that? Oh, so many different people inspire me. And I know a lot of people say they're, they're grandparents. Um, but the woman who inspires me a lot and keeps me going. She isn't around anymore. It was my um, maternal grandmother. Her name was Marion Cheryl and she loved gardens and she used to take us 
she lived in uh, South Florida, and when we would visit her, she would take us to um, the experimental station, the fruit station that had all the different types of fruit trees, and we would wander around, and she would eat everything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Sounds think we fun. were supposed to do that. I don't think we were supposed to do that, but <laughs> yeah, it really got me interested. I, I still love citrus to this day. I'm really interested in all the varieties. Yeah. Right. Do you have a green thumb and you grow a lot of plants at home on your own? No, I, I worked as the nursery manager and then the garden manager at the Maui Nui Botanical Gardens for so long. Uh, I came home and my garden became a weed patch, I'm afraid. I'm like, mm. the, mm-hmm. I'm like the shoemaker's children. There's, I just put it all into the garden. I get it. It's, I think it's like a, a chef who cooks all day, and when he goes home, he probably doesn't want to cook. Maybe just drives through McDonald's or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you, you know, you have a good excuse because you, you do that all day long at work. Um, so besides the job that you're in, and I know you love your job, and, um, you know, what, what, is, what else would you like to do? Uh, what, what, what else do you aspire to? What is your next dream job? I am... One of the things that I really have been getting interested in is seeds and seed storage. I'm actually, I just have a fascination for tiny things and things, you know, looking through microscopes. And that's one of the things that I have patients and one of those people that likes details. So um, I'd like to do more work with seeds when I'm not doing this job. Again, I would like to spend more time um, learning more about the mysteries of dormancy and, um, what causes things to germinate, what causes them to survive in storage, what causes them to not survive in storage. Yeah, so let's talk more about that, and because uh, it's kind of like a Jurassic Park kind of situation, you know, um, bringing back or uh, plants that are down to their last individual, or I think in some cases they're, they're where this plant might actually be extinct in the wild, but they have seed that they're trying to bring the species back. So let's talk about the seed storage program that you have at the gardens because you started that. Well, we we started, we followed the lead of the Laukahi Network, which is a statewide network for rare plant conservation in Hawaii. And they hosted, um, they along with Lion Arboretum, which has the Seed Conservation Lab, which started a long time ago, more than 20 years ago, mm-hmm. were are the leaders in this. And so they had several conferences and forums and meetings that I attended and I got really inspired because I realized that first of all there was not that kind of seed storage happening on Maui although obviously many of the organizations Hawaii National Park and um, DLNR do store seeds but a lot of times they're storing them for the short term but these were pretty low-tech um, methods that they were teaching to keep seeds alive for longer than they would be normally and it really is this really economical and very um, easy way for horticulture to support land managers because you've got a lot of genetic diversity in a very small space and it can survive for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And that's there in case of um, extinction events. It's there to buy land managers time to manage threats so that they can use them for restoration. And so it's just a genetic backup, almost like the the cultivars that we were talking about, the cultivated crop varieties. Right. Um, those have to be planted in the ground because they have to be plants in the ground. They're not. They don't grow from seeds. But with native plants, you can you can store five thousand ohia seeds in a space this big. So um, that's something that we started in 2015, and now we're really lucky to have a part-time seed storage technician this year for the first time. Her name's Kathy Davenport. And she's had a long career in um, with the state plant quarantine division and also as an ethnobotany teacher. And so she loves the tediousness of it. But she's been able to go out to the wild and support those land managers with labor, actually collecting seeds from the wild and then processing them. It's very laborious and drying them down and packaging them and keeping records and making sure that people know what they have in storage. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, and Kathy's great, I, and I remember her from uh, when she was working with the plant quarantine, and uh, so she also comes to the gardens with a lot of uh, knowledge, and especially when you know some of these invasive pests that we we're talking about, I, I think she's probably always keeping an eye out for anything new that might be coming to the gardens that could be detrimental too. 
Yes, for sure. Yeah. And in a pinch, she can do it a great ethnobotany tour too. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, absolutely. I actually had a chance uh, back in the um, uh, in the ni- in the er- mid nineteen nineties. Uh, to go to Lion Arboretum and see some of those um, plants that they were um, propagating. And it was a, it, that's where I first uh, thought, man, this is like a Jurassic Park situation. Everything is just mm-hmm. so clean and sterile and organized. And I mean, you really have to be focused on, on the work, right? And so, um, you know, it's such an important job also because if you do something wrong, you could be basically seeing the last of that species that's a big that's responsibility true. yeah yeah that's true but one of the things that's really good about it is we're not we shouldn't be the only ones doing it we're not the only mm. ones doing it now there's other people on other islands and we what we do like for example we're working with um a statewide initiative to collect as much ohia lahua genetic diversity as possible in advance of the possible spread of rapid ohia death and that's happening all over the state and that's also from uh, that started at Lion and Lion Arboretum as well. Right, tell and, us tell um, us more about uh, rapid ohia death or ROD because I'm sure some folks have heard about it and and you know what is it and why is it such a concern? Well, in my understanding, it's it, it's a fungus and it there are two strains of it, one of which is quite lethal and arrived fairly recently on the big island and there's been what some tens of thousands i think last i heard it was 80,000 i think there's more acres of ohia trees that have just completely died because of this this disease and it does spread on the wind and through spores um and and you can hike and you can introduce it by hiking as well so it's really important if you're hiking in a place that has ohia now to clean your gear, clean especially the, the soles of your shoes with uh, rubbing alcohol. It's the, the same kind of thing that we're doing like with COVID. Mm-hmm. You just want to make sure that you're not tracking the, these fungal spores from one ohia area to another ohia area. And the seed banking um, that was started by uh, Lion Arboretum and now is being carried on by Marion Chow and a lot of other pe- people um, is... Basically, what they're going to be doing this year is we're helping them to to get seeds from trees that haven't been collected from yet. And then they're doing research to find out which trees might be resistant, naturally resistant to rapid ohia death. Because in any large population, there will be some plants that are resistant to whatever disease is going around. And they're hoping to plant um, rapid ohia death resistant ohia orchards in the future. So that those can help reforest some of those areas. Right. How how can people besides you know being aware of you know hiking from place to place and cleaning their gear and their boots and and all of that? Uh, how else can people help? Is there is, wanna... there is there some kind of um, you know donation campaign? Or is there what, how can, can people help with education or what can people do? There's some really good information online. Um, if you just Google rapid ohia death, there, there's a fantastic program um, that will tell you all about it. Um, there's, it's important that we're not making lay from ohia right now and moving them from island to island. And I know that's illegal. And I know that um, a lot of the halal have gotten on board with that and they know, and they're helping to share that, you know, ohia is not the thing to be using right now in lay um, because it just transports the material and people are not using ohia wood and transporting ohia wood. Um, and yeah, the other thing is just, I know that they're hoping that citizen scientists and hikers will help people, help the, the Department of Land and Natural Resources notice when there's uh, a sudden ohia death. You know, if you have a tree in your yard or if you see it when you're hiking, if you see the branch die back that's dying back quickly, um, give them a call and give the Maui Invasive Species Committee a call or give the Department of Natural Land and Natural Resources a call and they'll come and take a look at it so that they can try to catch it early. Right. If you see a bunch of uh, ohia trees that are, you know, dying or, or dead, uh, that definitely isn't normal. So people should are encouraged to report that. You know, the high school that I went to is called Lelehua. So, oh. that was, yeah, so that was... Uh, 
something that we always uh, grew up uh, with was not picking the blossoms because if you picked it, then it would rain. So we always left them alone. <laughs> Good for you. So, we're trained um, correctly. Yes. So um, I know you have a lot of uh, different programs at the gardens that the public is um, invited to uh, participate in. And some of those programs may have been impacted by uh, COVID and the pandemic and restrictions that we have on and gathering and things like that. But um, one of the things that you have going on every week is a plant sale. And can you tell us more about that? Yes. Ever since uh, the pandemic started, we changed up our plant sales and we also changed up our plant donations. So we have both a weekly plant sale and a weekly plant giveaway. And so follow us on social media to find out when those are and, and just see really good information about uh, what plants are being given away that week and what plants are for sale. We do it in a kind of a contactless way. So we put the plants underneath our sign. They're just right there. And it's sort of a first come, first serve. Those are the giveaway plants. We're trying to do a lot of Hawaiian canoe crops because I know everybody's really interested in growing food right now. And we want to get these mm -hmm. old heritage varieties out there. So lots of huli giveaway, lots of pieces of coal, pieces of sugar cane you can plant, lots of sweet potato cuttings. Um, but then for the plant sales, those are a little bit different, but those are also somewhat contactless. You look on social, on Facebook or Instagram, see what is available and you can just direct message us or call us and we'll reserve the plants. You can pay online or you can come pay later. You can pick them up anytime during the week. That's great. So it can be totally contactless. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, you have a, um, sort of a little club of people who help with, um, uh, pulling weeds or uh, potting seedlings. And uh, I, I know you're not actively recruiting for that right now because of the pandemic, but tell, tell us about this little program that you have. It has a very uh, interesting name. Yes, it has an interesting name. We've had this <laughs> name for a long time. It's the Weed and Pot Club. They weed for an hour in the garden, and then they pot up plants in the nursery for an hour, and then they spend another hour talking usually. But they are a wonderful group. Some of them have been coming for the last, since since the club started, which was about 18 years ago. And they come every week on Wednesday from 8.30 to 10.30. And if you're a Hawaii, re if you're a Maui resident and are interested, just give us a call. Um, you can bring your own gloves to be safe. We do wear masks. And in fact, every all our visitors are asking them to wear masks the entire time they're on site. And we do keep distancing. But we have the advantage of a beautiful outdoor space that's quite breezy and a lot of places to weed where you can spread out, but you can still talk and hear each other. So it's a great right. group. Yeah, volunteers are so critical. And, and I know that you also welcome interns from time to time. Uh, do you have any on staff? Well, not on staff, but any helping you now? Yes, we have uh, two Kuku interns at the moment. Um, one is named Malia Rehi, and she has been doing a fabulous job with us. She's taking on um, clearing and helping us to design and implement a Hawaiian alphabet garden, a piapa'a. And we're just about to start with a new Kuku intern as well in the next few weeks, and his name is... Um, Jordan Tabura. Awesome. So I think it's really a, a, a really good opportunity for students from UH Maui College because they're located so cl uh, closely to the gardens. So it's probably an, a really easy walk or bike ride there to go get some um, internship hours and maybe get some credit for through the college and get their education. Yep. Yeah. And even if you, um, you know, even during this pandemic, we can accept we can accept people who are trying to get hours for school. Um, likely, you would be doing weeding, mulching, potting up plants in the nurseries, cleaning seeds, and learning about seed banking. There's all kinds of jobs to do. Mm -hmm. And so, when this pandemic passes, uh, hopefully sooner than later, um, hopefully you can pick up on some of those really great workshops that I know uh, you folks have done in the past. Um, if, if folks haven't been to the Maui Nui Botanical Gardens, I really encourage you to go and check it out. Admission is free for Hawaii residents. I think they need to provide, what, an ID, uh, a state mm -hmm. ID or something? 
Right? Yes. Right. Yeah, we'll just check a state ID. Okay, and for visitors who are not residents, you um, it's a ten dollar admission fee, and it goes to a great cause, of course, to help the gardens um, keep going and um, doing what they do. And uh, it's a great, it's, it's like an oasis, really, in the middle of Kahului. It's just a, a very peaceful place, beautiful place with all the landscaping. You can see all of the native plants and the her heritage plants, as you call them, and really learn a lot, learn their stories and you know, get some great tips if you wanted to uh, go and plant them in your own yard. And I, I know the folks at the garden are so helpful in um, telling you how to plant them, how to nurture them, and maybe harvest fruits or seeds and anything you want to know they can help you with. Absolutely. And our, our, our team likes to talk. And one thing that's really nice, if, especially if you're thinking about trying to incorporate some native plants in your own yard, come down to the Mata Maui Nui Botanical Gardens. We're at 150 Kanaloa Avenue. And we'd be happy to walk you around and show you what those plants look like when they grow up, when they're 45, 50 years old. A lot of people use, for example, pohini hina as a ground cover, but come see what it looks like as a 45-year-old plant. It's really mm -hmm. a very large shrub. <laughs> yeah, you have some really interesting looking uh, trees that are, you know, pretty old there and uh, have a lot of character. I think you even have one that maybe is on the registered... Um, or the historic, or what do you call them? Uh, what I, what is that? Significant tree, trees. We yes, I know what you're thinking of. We did that was an ali tree, and then it, unlike the, um, unlike the Hawaiian saying, it actually did fall in a wind one day. Oh no! So that tree is no longer oh, there. Oh no! But. People have have taken the wood and made some beautiful things out of it. So. Oh, that was a great. And tree. we have. We have that the keiki of that tree in the same place now. Right. Oh, so, you know, some of the other um, programs and workshops that you're hoping to get back to, um, you want to mention some of those? Yeah. Well, you know, historically, we do a lot of annual events. So we have been doing the, um, in March, we usually would be doing Ho'omau, the Hawaiian Language Immersion Fundraiser. Um, that's put on by Naleo, um, Pananaleo, which is the parent group for the Hawaiian language schools. Uh, they are trying to do that in, on June 12th. We'll see. We'll see if it's possible this year. Uh, we always have um, the Lo'ulu or Breadfruit Day in September. We did have to cancel it last year, and we'll see what happens this year. It's a food festival. It's a place, it's a time to learn about cooking with ulu and taste different ulu dishes and buy ulu trees and basically meet all the people that work with breadfruit all across the state. Really hoping to bring that back someday soon. Yeah, ulu is one um, of the things I love to get from the garden. They grow really oh, yeah. well there. They do. There's some beautiful old trees there. And then we will for sure have our Arbor, Arbor Day Garden Expo again. We did it this year and it was very different. We normally have it in the garden and lots of conservation groups and you just it's first come first serve, come get one native tree per person. We give we gave away 1300 trees this year, but we had to do it in a drive through. So we had people reserve online and then they waited in line to get into the parking lot. We actually had this in the uh, War Memorial parking lot at the gymnasium. And people also brought donations for the Maui Food Bank and they would get a windshield card and then they would drive to the place with the windshield card, the color on the windshield card, and then volunteers could see from a distance what tree they had reserved and they would bring the tree to their car and it was a contactless thing where they will do that again if we have to, but we're hoping we can go back to our usual kinds of events where we have all right. kinds of hands-on cultural activities like oi oi making and makahiki games and making lei with native plants mm -hmm. and things like that because mm -hmm. that's that's the stuff that really is a lot of fun that uh annual tree giveaway that is like you know because i've been to several of those events that is like a, a rock concert i cannot believe <laughs> how many people line up waiting for the gates to open and they're there i think at least a couple hours if not more lining up outside the gate waiting very patiently i might add 
Mm -hmm. uh, for those gates to open, they're so excited to get their plant. And, you know, that's a, a really nice thing to see because, you know, growing up, I, I didn't know about native plants. I didn't see a lot of enthusiasm for native plants and um, understanding the cultural uses or the environmental um, significance of those plants but today is such a different story and I think a lot has to do with environmental education happening both in schools and in you know other programs for youth and really um, getting that information and awareness up and so when when kids learn in school and they get excited um, or they go to, uh, participate in an internship program or some other environmental education program and they go home and they talk to their parents, they talk to their family about it, and then everybody gets excited. And today, I don't know if when I was growing up, we would have hundreds of people lining up to get a free Native Hawaiian tree. So, you know, hats off to all of you for what you do. Oh, thank you. No, I, I, I've seen it change too. You know, when I started at Maui Nui Botanical Gardens, we would have a native plant sale and people would come and buy them, but they didn't ask a lot of questions. Now, if you don't have the exact ohia lahua variety that they want or the kalo variety that they want, they already know, you know, a lot of people know now. So it makes one, my job harder, but I'm really happy. One, one thing that I think you folks do really well is educate people. You folks are so uh, open and, and free about, uh, about that. And I, I really like how you help people understand what would grow best in their own backyard, whether it's, you know, if they live in a wet area, they're going to want to try to grow these certain species. If they live in a drier area, they might want to do xeriscaping or something that really makes sense so they can be successful at it. But, you know, it also helps um, to keep these native plants around. And uh, we were talking earlier uh, about uh, nowadays people can actually get a, an endangered species and plant that in their backyard where that wasn't always the case, um, but today you can do that. And, um, you know, we talked about the benefits of people who have a green thumb that can grow um, and cultivate endangered native species in their backyard and how that might help the overall conservation efforts. Yeah, and that's not um, something to be afraid of at all. A lot, sometimes I hear people say, oh, no, I can't take an endangered species. What if it dies? But when people sell endangered species in Hawaii, you have to have a tag that you have gotten legally from the state of Hawaii that says this is an endangered species that, and it was propagated from a cultivated plant. So it was not collected from the wild. The seeds did not come from the wild. It came from a cultivated plant. And please don't plant me outside of your yard because there might be endangered species that are related to it nearby and you might start mixing up different genetics and, right. and interfering with the natural populations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you do look for those red tags. You'd have to have those. But um, there's lots of endangered species that grow wonderfully in the landscape. Our logo plant, the Scavola caraceae or the dwarf malpaca, is a very long-lived, beautiful ground cover with very few pest problems. And there's just about 40 left in the world and they're on a little sand dune and that's all there all that exists but they're a wonderful landscaping plant and anyone who has any kind of sandy soil can grow it yeah and if you folks um keep up the great work you're doing there will be more than that in the future i'm sure that's right yeah we're, we're kind of winding down we're coming to the end of our time together unfortunately i you know i could talk to you and about conservation forever um so you know, all the work that you're doing and all the, you know, there, it is a high pressure kind of um, a task that you have before you. So, you know, w what do you do to wind down? And, you know, if you do you have a, a certain place that you like to be when you need to unwind and de-stress and kind of, you know, refocus and where do you go? I, I really love um, hiking along the rocky shores. I live in Haiku. And I love exploring those rocky beaches that are all along the North Shore. Um, you need to, I, I think they're a really unique kind of an ecosystem. And there's quite a few native plants still in those areas. And so I just, I, I spend a lot of time looking uh, landward, <laughs> but hiking along the 
coast. <laughs> so you're around plants all day, and where you go to de-stress is still around plants. So you you're really oh, yeah. dedicated. <laughs> as long as I don't have to take care of them, then it's not stressful. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us today on Conservation Conversations Hawaii and sharing your mana'o. And uh, I, I hope people do go and check out Maui Nui Botanical Gardens located at 150-150 Kanaloa Avenue in Kahului. And uh, we'll get that website up. And uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to talking to you again you know, down the road and see what you're up to. And um, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank our uh, producers who uh, brought this show to you, uh, Darif Wailuku. Thanks so much, guys. And uh, we'll see you all again on the, our next episode. Aloha.